So Michelle, you go. Yes, yes, good morning. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this uh, new day and this morning today. So I'll just make a short prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we gather together once more in your presence, Lord, this morning, bless all of us present here, all our intentions. Bless our hearts, Lord, that we may take in whatever's being taught today and go out and share it with others, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking control of all the minds and the tongues of everyone present here. Teach them your word, Lord, and let them go out and share this word with others. Lord, bless all those present here and their family members and their intentions, Lord. Let them go out and share this word with their family members, Lord. Lord, bless today and bless our food that we eat and everything that we do today. Let it be you, Lord, with us throughout the day. Let your presence fill us throughout the day and let us keep our minds and our focus only on you, Jesus, throughout the day. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given us, for the gift of life, for another beautiful day. And let us make use of this day, Lord, to do what you want us to do, Lord, not what we want to do, but always keeping you in our focus, in you in our presence, and doing what you want us to do. Lord, we offer this day and this time to you. Holy Spirit, take control of all the internet connections and all the devices that everyone is using. Take control of my tongue, Holy Spirit, and let every word that I speak be from you, Holy Spirit. Make this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. So good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you'll have your Bibles ready and you'll mark the scriptures that I've been, I'll be telling you all to. So we'll go ahead with this teaching. And today I'm going to talk to you all. Can you all hear me? Yes, sister. Today I'm going to talk to you all on the fruit of the spirit. See, as we are coming into the passion of Christ, and now it's going to be today's Wednesday, tomorrow is Holy Thursday. So I'm going to talk to you all about the fruit of the spirit. But before I go, I'll go on to the fruit of the spirit, I just want to tell you all about the role of the Holy Spirit once more in our life. So Jesus uh, told his disciples after his death that God would send the spirit of truth to be with us. To, to be with them forever. So God always wants us to walk in the spirit. So basically he wants us to walk in confidence that God is with us. So in a, sister, can you read John 14, 26? Yes, sister. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Amen. Amen. So here he says that the advocate, the Holy Spirit, with the helper, the comforter, the intercessor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. So in, Jesus is saying in my place to represent me and to act on my behalf. So Jesus is saying that he will act on his behalf and he will teach us all things and he will help us to remember everything that he has told us. So the main role of the Holy Spirit is, is that he is our helper. So the Holy Spirit knows what each one of us needs. So that's why we need to call on to the Holy Spirit every day. So there are many ways the Holy Spirit can come to us and help us in our daily lives. So I just wanted you all to like get the role of the Holy Spirit so that you all know that with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can go ahead on this spiritual journey. So he's our helper, he's our advocate, our intercessor, our counselor, our strengthener, our standby. So when we make this decision to follow, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit and to be obedient to, the, to his word in our lives, it's not going to be a, uh, natural. So every day there will be like testimonies every day. There will be miracles. There would be like breakthroughs. There would, uh, and that is the supernatural life that you and me are and everyone who believes in Jesus and who has the Holy Spirit is called to live. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. So the role of the Holy Spirit as the comforter is like in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 1. So can you read 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4? Yes. Blessed be the no. Lord, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us 
in all our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. Amen. Amen. So here in uh, 2 Corinthians 1 uh, verses 3 to 4, he says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So we have the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and he comforts, comforts us in our painful situations or difficulty or problems when we are sad. Uh, when we are lonely, when we are frustrated, when we are disappointed, when we are rejected. So the Holy, <clears throat> excuse me, the Holy Spirit personally comforts us through the people rooted, rooted in the word. Like if you're rooted in the word, you can go ahead and comfort the others. So make note of this, uh, these verses that I'm telling you, 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 to 4. And uh, also, can we read Sister John 16, 6 to 7? Yes. John 6, sister. John chapter 16, verse 6 to 7. Okay. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Amen. Amen. So this is uh, Jesus telling us that he, when he goes, he's going to, he has to go because the advocate will not come to us. For him, for the advocate to come to us, he has to go. So Jesus here is telling his disciples uh, this so that they must have Jesus. So what must have Jesus said to his disciples that fill their hearts with sorrow? So he said, uh, He's a, he's, he was speaking about his death because every disciple had a relationship with Jesus up to this point. And in these three and a half years of the ministry that he was with them, with, with the disciples, because of that, when he spoke about his death and about leaving them and going, so they were feel, filled with sorrow. They were feeling very sad, the disciples, because he was talking about his death. So that's when he said this. And in verse 7, Jesus is saying, he's saying that, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go. For if I go not away, the advocate will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Jesus is saying it is necessary for him to go. Because if he does not go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. And praise God, today you and I have the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And he will never leave. He will never leave your family, your friends, etc. Because, But the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He will never leave you and he will always comfort you. And he is the one who defends us from sin. He also guides us into all truth, helping us to grasp the meaning of Jesus' words. And how do we understand the scriptures? How do we understand uh, the Bible? It is with the help of the Holy Spirit. So he is the one who guides us into all truth, helping us to grasp the meaning of Jesus' words, actions and miracles. And as we live out our faith, it is the spirit that animates us as disciples, empowering us to use our unique gifts and to make a difference to the world. So once we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to go out, go out and make a difference to the world. So never get discouraged by whatever situation you face as the Holy Spirit is always comforting you and backing you up because scripture says that God, that the God of all comfort has comforted you. And now when you receive that comfort, you are no more sorrowful. You are going out and comforting others because you have received that comfort you are able to go out and comfort others with the same love and the same comfort that you have received from God. So I just want to tell you if anyone, if you all has any questions or need to stop me at any given time, if I'm going too fast, just tell me. And if you have not got the scriptures also, just let me know. So no human can comfort us as the Holy Spirit. So it is supernatural and it's divine. So when we go through a loss or a death of a loved one, it we depend on the Holy Spirit so he can comfort. Don't depend on others. Depend on the Holy Spirit so he can comfort us and quickly help us to get over our loss and to get on with life. So the, the Holy Spirit is also plays a role as our intercessor. So sister, can you read Romans 8.26? Yes, sister. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, 
but that very spirit intercedes with the signs to the folk words. Amen. Amen. So here it is saying, likewise, the spirit also helps us in our weaknesses and our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. We don't know what we should pray as we ought. But the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Like we just had a session of uh, talking or uh, speaking in tongues. So that is what the spirit is doing. The spirit is intercessing, uh, interceding for us. So even though all of us are born again and the Holy Spirit lives in us, do we still have areas in our lives where there are weaknesses? Yes, we all have weaknesses in spite of being born again and having a relationship with God. And this scripture says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And so how does the Holy Spirit help us? He makes intercessions for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. This, this scripture is speaking about praying in the spirit, about praying in tongues. And why is it so important to pray in tongues? Because it's a wonderful tool. It's a powerful weapon, a gift of God that God has given every believer. So many a times we take it for granted and say, why should I pray in tongues? But we need to understand this for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. That's what he's saying. That means that God has a plan and his plan is unique for every person. But for God's will or his plan to come to pass in our lives, we need the wisdom. And the wisdom that mystery can only be revealed or unlocked when we pray in tongues. So what is happening when we are praying in tongues? So the spirit itself is making intercession. That means the Holy Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf. Because the Holy Spirit knows better than us what is the will of God for our life. So tomorrow I may not know what schemes the devil has planned for me or is plotting against me. But the Holy Spirit knows. And because he knows when I make a decision to surrender my vocal cords and allow him to intercede on my behalf, what happens is the will of God is getting revealed in my life. So use your gift of tongues as often as possible and be in constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, focus on the word. Both have to go hand in hand. So you're using your gift on gift of tongues and fo focusing on the word. Both have to go hand in hand. But that is not that. But and that is what will reside in a believer living a supernatural life. So when you're leading the supernatural life, you're you're praying in tongues and you're focusing on the word will go hand in hand. So also praying in tongues, like the devil cannot understand that language when we pray in the spirit. So tongues is a basically a prayer of faith so when you're speaking you don't know what you're speaking and you can never doubt when you pray in tongues because whatever you pray whatever prayer you pray from your mind you can doubt it so example if you're praying for a job and you are after having made the prayer the devil starts putting thoughts in your mind will this work will i get the job how do you know you're going to get do you know you're good because the devil knows that doubts is a thief which steals god's promises in our life so when you pray in tongues because you don't know what you're praying. It is a prayer of faith and you cannot doubt it. So that's the that's the advantage of praying in tongues. So it's a prayer of faith and you cannot doubt it. So pray in tongues and surrender to the Lord. Praying in tongues also with the word of God makes you connect to the divine and that is going to bring the Holy Spirit to search the hearts of those you have been interceding. So for it, for so the Holy Spirit is going to search the hearts of those who have been interceding for it, cannot be understood with our human brain. But in the supernatural, when we are studying the word and praying in the spirit, the two together will now bring the supernatural result. So praying in tongues and reading your word, studying the word. So those are the two important things. The Holy Spirit brings these revelations to us. And when we pray in tongues and study the word of God, so your intimacy, your revelations, your secrets will be mind-blowing when you connect the two. So basically, that's the thing is to connect the two. So when we spend time with the Holy Spirit, when we spend time with his word, when we are praying in tongues and getting connected to the divine, what do you think is going to happen to us? Are we going to be just ordinary people? We should be excited and open our mouths and tell everyone what God is doing in our lives and share the secrets that we are receiving. You should never keep the saying, always share it. So when we receive the love of God, we will never be able to sit still. We will always want to tell all we meet what the Lord has done for us. So we will start then bearing fruit. So sister, can you use, uh, read John 15, 16? Yes, sister. You did not choose me, but I chose you 
and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Amen. Amen. So he's saying, uh, I have not chosen, uh, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And uh, you should go out and bear fruit, that fruit that should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. So how are we going to bear these fruit? So if God has chosen you and me and ordained us, suppose God has chosen us and ordained you and me and ordained us by giving us the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the guide, the advocate. Since he has given us the Holy Spirit on the inside, then God expects you and me to go and bear fruit. And that fruit will only come because of our relationship with the Holy Spirit, because of the time we are spending with his word and praying in the spirit. So all these things together will help us to bear those fruits. So if you don't have time as you're busy with your household chores, at least spend uh, time to take a scripture and meditate upon it. And as you're cooking or you're driving, etc., pray in the spirit. So while meditating on that word and the Holy Spirit will give you revelations and teach you. And then when you are comforted, he will use you to comfort others. So we can at least spend 30 minutes on the word in the day and pray in tongues throughout the day and, and bear fruit that will last. So now let us learn how we can go ahead and bear fruit. So before Jesus underwent his passion in John 16, so we are also going to go to that passion day. The days are coming near now. So he told the apostles about the work of the Holy Spirit. So he told them not to be disheartened. It is for your good that I am going away, he said. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus said, Jesus said this, so God fulfilled this promise during the feast of Pentecost. So a little over 2000 years ago, pouring out his Holy Spirit upon all believers then and ever since. So this is when he fulfilled that promise. So the great, a great gift himself, the Holy Spirit comes bearing fruits. So with him comes this, uh, this, uh, these fruits that there are four bags full of them. So the first bag contains the gift of sanctification also called the Isaiah gifts. So this is the first bag of fruits that the Holy Spirit will come bearing because it was the prophet who spoke about them, the prophet Isaiah. So uh, sister, can you read also Galatians 5, 22 to 23? Yes. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Amen. Amen. So the first uh, bag of, uh, the, there are four bags full of these fruits. So the, the first bag contains the gift of sanctification called the Isaiah gifts because it was the prophet who spoke about them, prophet Isaiah. So these gifts are wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, and piety. The second bag contains the fruits which St. Paul writes about, which Sister Jessica just read in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. So uh, in this, uh, these fruits are love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So although there are pl plenty of other fruit we need, to bear as Christians. So the third bag has the gifts of service. Now this is the third bag. It's the gifts of service. Sister, can you read Ephesians 4.11? Yes. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Amen. Amen. So this third bag of gifts have the gift of service. So it's basically teaching, serving, giving, encouraging, counseling, pastoring, and several others we can find mentioned in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So, and to the Romans in Romans 12 verses 6 to 8. Sister, can you also read Romans 12 verses 6 to 8? Yes. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering the teacher in teaching. Amen. 
and eight also sister six seven the and eight exalted, yes the exalted in exaltation the giver in generosity the leader in diligence the compassionate in cheerfulness amen so these are some of the gifts so the fourth bag contains gifts of manifestation also called charisms so what is a charism it's an extraordinary power as of healing given to a christian by the holy spirit for the good of the church so when we find uh, what which we can find in saint paul's first letter to the corinthians so sister can you read uh, 1 corinthians 12 verses 7 to 12 yes 1 corinthians 12 Verses seven to twelve. Yes, yes. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. to another prophecy to another the discernment of spirits to another various kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues all Any these are activated all these are activity activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses amen amen So also in uh, verse number twelve, he says, "For oh. as the body is one, just you read verse twelve. Yes, sister. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ." Amen. Amen. So here we uh, we can see how the Holy Spirit gives us all these different gifts, like you are using the gift of tongues. But uh, he says he he gives them he distributes to to each one individual as he wills. So as he wills, he will distribute to you. So if you're praying in tongues, he's already given you the gift of tongues. So you're using it. So for as the and these charisms are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. So as he wants to give it to us, he will give it to us the Holy Spirit. So for that, we need to be rooted in the Word, and we need to. also call on to the holy spirit every day so this isn't a rule as to how we should get these gifts because they are given at the discretion of the holy spirit however there tends to be a pattern of receiving them so we begin with the gifts of sanctification like becoming holy so that makes us more like jesus so the moment that we start becoming more like jesus we start to bear fruit in abundance so when we start bearing fruit we find ourselves called into service and when we start serving god we start to bear the extraordinary gifts of power so the fruit of the spirit in the in the in the letter to the galatians uh, paul uh, saint paul says that the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self control so this list is not comprehensive so there are other fruits that we can see described in the bible so one of them is humility so it's an essential fruit for a christian to bear so we need to learn to respect and honor others see them as god sees them basically we need to see everybody as god sees them not different so god sees us all equal so we need to realize we are nothing without god so one of the reasons we need to bear this fruit is because they identify us as disciples of christ so jesus says this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples so this he says in john chapter 15 verse number 8 you all can note it down and in your bibles so we show ourselves to be followers of christ by the fruit we bear so how would one know that you are a follower of christ it's by the fruit that you are bearing so it is helpful to our understand understanding of these fruit so and, and the other gifts is that the, they are divine not worldly gifts so consequently our definition should reflect that so consider peace now in this world which is generally defined as an uh, so peace is generally defined as an absence of conflict so that's the meaning of peace normally we define it like that but spiritually peace is when a person is calm in the midst of conflict so we need to ask ourselves today do we have that peace the spiritual peace that we are talking about are we calm in the midst of all that is going on like the pandemic these wars these earthquakes the floods are we peaceful people so 
when we describe peace it is defined as an absence of conflict but actually spiritual peace is when a person is calm in the midst of conflict and you get so when we face the storms in our life and who doesn't everybody is facing a storm in their life today so do we remain unruffled or do we panic so jesus is asking us today are you all panicking or are you all unruffled you know are you all getting worried are you all getting scared is there fear in you so that's what he's asking us do we have this peace that he's offering so then if you consider joy also in the world joy is often used un- inter- interchangeably with happiness so normally people think when they are happy they are joyful but there's a difference so joy is more christian than happiness so however happiness is fleeting happiness is only momentarily so happiness is based basically on circumstances so we are not created for happiness we are created for joy for joy is everlasting so happiness comes from the world but the joy of christ is something we are created for so a joyful christian is a great witness so when we are we are joyful we can be a witness to god so you might find it interesting to note that the word happy is hardly mentioned in scripture so jesus never wished anybody happy this happy anything neither did saint paul but they both spoke a lot about joy which is not obtained by the position uh, possession of material things but by the knowledge that one has possession of heaven by faith in christ jesus when we have faith in jesus then we should have that joy so we have the knowledge that we have that faith so are we joyful people today jesus is asking all of us present here and all who's going to be listening are you all joyful people so are we gentle people gentle in our attitude our tone of voice in our nature are we patient so let us imagine for instance that we are stuck in a traffic jam so how long is it before that we have this in this this urge and in you know, hit the horn we get irritated when we are driving in the traffic jam and we have this indescribable urge and you hit the horn and blast everybody's senses so what about self control when was the last time that we got angry or how much do we pig out at a dinner party we we attended last night so if these are occasion lapses for instance if we get up if we get mad once in a blue moon or if we decide to go all out or at that buffet table we go for once in a while it's not something that should unduly disturb us but if we lose our temper constantly we are getting angry constantly or we keep binge eating like we keep pigging out on food then it's a cause of concern because it's a sign that we are not bearing the fruit of self control so the fruit of self control comes in various forms like so that we should normally it's not, we are not bearing the fruit of self control that we should bear so then again what about love it's another it's another fruit what about love which most of which is the most important fruit so we need to bear it because it is essential for our faith so saint paul writes sister can you read 1 corinthians 13 1 to 3 yes if i speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love i am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if i have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love i am nothing if i give away all my possessions and if i hand over my body so that i may boast but do not have love i gain nothing Amen. Amen. So, thank you, Holy Spirit. So, here Saint Paul is clearly putting to us. He's saying, if I speak in tongues like we are all speaking of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging, a uh, clanging cymbal. So, he's saying we are just making noise. We are not doing anything because we don't have love, and we are talking in tongues and doing all this. And if we don't have love, we are just making noise. So, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith and that can move mountains. but if i do not have love i am nothing so he is essentially saying that it doesn't matter how beautifully we sing how beautifully we talk or pray if we don't have love in our hearts we are merely making noise that's what he is basically trying to put it in simple english we are just making noise and taking up space so if we start working miracles and doing great signs and wonders which we all will all learn about when we open the bag full of charisms they count for nothing but if we don't have love they count for nothing if we don't have love so we we might martyr ourselves for god but again if we don't have love we gain nothing so what's the use of doing all this if we don't have love he's trying to say that in short 
nothing we say, sing, preach, do, achieve, accomplish counts for anything if we don't have love. So that's why God always looks at your heart. So what, it is, what is it? The world generally defines love in a romantic term like and speaks about it in terms of feelings. So however, divine love is vastly different from how the world looks at it. If one wanted a definition, St. Paul offers a beautiful definition of love in his letter to the Corinthians. So sister, can you read 1 Corinthians 14, 4 to 7? Yes. yes. Those who speak in a tongue build up themselves but those who prophesy build up the church. Sister, no, now, sister, 1 Corinthians 14, chapter 14, verse 4 to 7. This is the, the same one. Those who speak in a tongue build up themselves. That was 1 those, Corinthians 13, sister. This is 1 Corinthians 14. This is the same one I'm reading. Okay, I'll just read it. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. So love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So this is what, so do we have a, uh, we have love in our heart? Do we have love in our heart? Not the way the world understands it, but the love that the way we have received it from Christ, the love of Christ. So this is what St. Paul is talking about. So are we judgmental about people? Do we expect people the way they are? Do we accept people the way they are? Or do we expect them to change before showing them any sign of love? So do we forgive them as Christ has forgiven us? Are we self-sacrificing to others? Do we truly love? He's asking us, do we truly love? When we examine ourselves in the light of these fruits that St. Paul speaks about, we discover how far we fall short of the fullness of these fruit in our life. So we think we have everything, but if we do not love, then we have nothing. So many of us have some of these fruit to varying degrees, but the idea is to bear it abundantly. So we, God is saying to bear it abundantly. So unlimited patience, total self-control, kindness, and gentleness at all times he wants us to bear. So how do we do this? How are we going to bear all these fruits, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, unlimited, like, you know, in our life? So we, uh, unlimited patience, gentleness, self-control, so by exercising more, willpower so we bear it by exercising more willpower so no willpower is never enough so unfortunately most of us have been trying to lead holy lives through our own efforts so it won't happen if you are trying to do it on our own it will not happen we need you have felt guilty you have tried harder and it is a cycle that endlessly repeats until we quit in disgust so sometimes because we are trying on our own willpower it never happens to bear these fruit so how then do we bear these fruit? How are we going to bear these fruit? So Jesus gives us an answer in this beautiful and uh, uh, about garden, uh, gardening. He says, I am the wine. Uh, sister, can you read John 15, 5 to 6? Yes. Five to six. John chapter 15. The... Verses 5 to 6. Yes, sister. I am the wine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Amen. So thank you, Holy Spirit. So this is how uh, so here we want to know how to bear fruit so jesus gives us the answer so in this beautiful analogy about gardening he says he is the wine and we are the branches and he's telling us if you remain in me and i in you you will bear much fruit he's saying also that apart from me you can do nothing so if you're without me and you're trying to do it on your own strength you can do nothing if you do not remain in me you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. See what he's telling us, that we will be picked up and thrown into the fire if we don't remain in him. So that's what happens to us if we are not all the time focused on Jesus. 
So the trick is growing spiritually is to be in Jesus. So that is the trick of growing spiritually to continuously be in Jesus. And all happens through Jesus. So he's saying, remain, remain in me. He says, if we think about it, we will realize the simple logic contained in his advice. All he's asking us to remain. He's not asking us any grand thing. He's just saying, remain in me, rooted in me, remain uh, like, be like the branches, cling to the vine. So have you passed an orchard and seen trees laden with fruit? So do you the, hear the branches grown and grunt, struggling to bear fruit? So suppose you see a tree which is full of fruit. Uh, can you hear it groaning with so many fruit that it's bearing? They don't need to exercise any effort. All they need to do is remain attached to the tree. So all these branches that are bearing all these heavy fruit are just attached to the vine. So this is why Jesus used this analogy of a vine and branches. So he's saying he's the vine. We cannot bear fruit on our own. So first you need to get that in our heads. We cannot bear fruit on our own. We need to be attached to the vine. And that is Jesus to bear fruit. So how? So all of you all must be asking, so how? How will we uh, bear these fruit? How will we do? So we will discover that there, in a, this in a moment. But let us look at something extraordinary that he says next. So sister, can you uh, read John 15 verse 7? Yes, sister. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. So this is an amazing promise. It's almost like Jesus is giving us a blank check. He's saying, if you remain in me and my words, that my, my words remain in you, whatever you're learning in scripture, remain in you, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. He's telling you whatever you wish will be done for you. So here is the promise that he's making to you that whatever you wish will be done for you. So it's almost like he's giving you a blank check. However, we often feel that he, he doesn't give us what we ask for. So sometimes we feel that he doesn't give us what he asks for, what we ask for. Although he's saying, whatever you ask for, I will give you. We feel like that, but he's not giving. So one of the reasons for this is because as St. James writes, uh, Sister, can you read James 4, verse 3? Yes. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Amen. Amen. So here he's telling us, uh, Jesus said, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. Ask. He said, remain in me and my words, in me, whatever you ask. But then again, we are saying, that when we are asking, we are not getting. So then St. James tell us, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So when we ask God for things, it is often for the things that will enhance our life here in this world. We are looking him out uh, for him to give us all these worldly pleasures, all these worldly things that will enhance our life here in this world. So this is limited. So even if we live up to 100 years, our lives will eventually end. So however, the life that follows lasts forever. So that is called the eternal life, the everlasting life. So forever is long. Is a long time. Basically, forever is a long time. So God wants us to focus on that rather than this. So although he does promise to look after our needs in the world, he says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the king, God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things of the world will be given to you as well. So he's clearly telling us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that first we need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, all these things means the things of the world will be given to you as well. So when we seek God's kingdom, we ask for things that will enable us to live abundant lives in it. So like these fruits we are learning about, one of the things we need to realize is that God doesn't give us what we ask for instantaneously. If we pray for patience, for instance, God does not reach out into a sack and, you know, take a whole lot of patience from it and shove it into us. No. What he does is to he tests our patience until we become patient. So uh, take for ex example me. I was also, I had limited patience like, you know. And uh, if, you, if I see someone doing wrong, I need to tell them. So I kept praying for patience. So God's way of answering my prayer was to throw me into situations where my patience was tested. So one, one instance when I went for a meeting with friends and as I was put together in a little group to discuss the things that the speaker had spoken about, 
there was a lady in my group who kept saying the most absurd things you can imagine and it was constantly on the tip of my tongue to tell her what she was saying was rubbish but i heard this voice in my head saying shut up michelle and listen so that is how we develop patience we need to also listen to others so at a, in the first year so after i jesus kept repeating his instructions to shut up so when i discovered the word and i i i had this type thing of always telling people what i thought they were doing was wrong so i i've in that time since i came into the word jesus has kept repeating his instructions to shut up not only did i become a more patient that i have than i have been but i've also learned a lot because we learn more when we are listening rather than talking sometimes we fail to understand so the the way to have jesus answer all our prayers is by remaining in him and letting his word remain in us so then we will bear much fruit as a result which will which again how to bear this fruit so the question again arises how do we bear so much fruit so the answer is we need to remain in jesus so how do we remain and now again you will ask me how do we remain in jesus so the simple answer is through prayer which does not consist of petitioning although it can include it but constant connectivity with god so like a branch on the vine jesus calls himself the true vine and as the branches in john 1551 so what does this mean for us it means that apart from jesus we can produce no fruit so the idea is to remain in jesus so any of you have any questions or anything up to here so far about the fruit of the spirit sister jessica anybody has any any queries any anything that they need to ask up to here Sister Jessica, can you all hear me? Go ahead, Michelle. No okay, problem. Okay. Okay. So, God. like, like a branch, Jesus calls himself the true vine, and as the branches, that is in John fifteen fifty one. So, what does it mean? For it means that apart from Jesus, who can we can produce no fruit. So, it means we we have nothing of ultimate value to offer others. It also means to stay alive, we must abide in Jesus. So, sister, can you read John fifteen four? Yes, sister. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just yes, so, here, so here he says to abide means to stay and to make our home with Jesus. So let us ask ourselves how at home are we with Jesus? So when we abide in Him, we are making our home with Him. So we want let us make use a modern uh, term to make it easier to understand. Some of us use our laptops. So to be able to use the laptop, it needs to be powered. So this is just an example I'm giving you. Uh, it needs to be a power so one way of ensuring it is power is connecting it to the power source so if we are permanently connected this laptop laptop always has a continuous stream of power however a laptop will also function possibly on a battery if it is charged so therefore even if it is unplugged from the power source it will continue to work while the power in the battery lasts so when it is uh, depleted it needs to be charged again so ideally we need to be permanently plugged into jesus so practice being in the presence of god continuously so so that's what we need to practice but until we can get in that state where we might want to begin frequent charging so spending so sometimes we we can't be permanently charged to jesus so then we need to get into that state where we can have frequent charges so spending an hour or so in personal prayer that's how we can start or how to go about doing this so as long as we do this faithfully and frequently we will bear fruit so the idea is to be uh is to be uh, to remain in jesus so that's what we need to practice daily is to remain in jesus taking like a scripture reading it you know going through it and meditating on it all day and night if you can't read the word holy you can plug your ears like i said before to plug your ears with the word of god and uh, continuously keep the word of god alive and active so the moment we stop we will uh, so the idea is to practice being in the presence of god so but until we can get to that state we might want to begin like frequent charging like i said spending an hour or so in personal prayer go to your room quietly close the door and you know spend that time with jesus maybe you can pray in tongues or you can maybe do some praise and worship or you can read the scriptures and ask the holy spirit to teach you because again he's your helper he's your counselor so ask him for anything that you want to do and as long as we do this faithfully and frequently we will bear fruit but the moment we stop we will we will return to living unspiritual life so if you prefer unfruitful lives without love 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, or self-control. Why? Because we don't have spiritual power. So that's the reason why we would prefer these. So let, uh, let the word remain in us. So the second element that Jesus speaks about to bear fruit is to let the word remain in us. So this means that we need to read the word of God and we need to study it and meditate upon it. So all this takes time. It takes patience. It's not going to happen overnight. So you need to pick up that Bible every day. That's what I've been telling you all, all along to the sessions that we need to start reading the word of God. But it's important for us not to keep our Bibles in the shelf. It's, about, it's important for us to keep it open in our houses, to let that word, to let the word come out from our mouth, to speak it out. That's how God created the world as well. He created it by speaking the word. So we need to speak the word. And we are the mouthpiece of Jesus. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus. So when the word comes out of our mouth, it, it goes and it, it becomes that double-edged sword. So we are, Jesus is using us. So the, uh, this, this, let this, letting this word remain as, in us means it's, it's about to bear fruit and to let the word in. So this means we need to read the word, study it, meditate upon it, and memorize it until it becomes an integral part of our lives. So in the letter of the Galatians, uh, which speaks about the fruit we must bear, St. Paul also talks about how some of us don't live according to the spirit, but according to the world ways. We're not living according to the spirit. So we need to be led by the spirit. So let us use this as an example to understand how, uh, how to let the word of God remain in us. So St. Paul writes in uh, <clears throat> Galatians 5, 16 to 21. Sister, can you read? Galatians 5, 16 to 21. Yes, sister. Live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, Strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. I mean, so we need to take this seriously because it's a warning. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what is St. Paul saying? He's saying, so I walk, uh, so I say walk by the spirit. He's telling us to walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. So whatever the flesh, flesh desires is contrary, opposite to the spirit and the, and, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So there is conflict with each other. So normally our flesh, our flesh and our spirit are always having conflict. We may want holy things, but our friends may want us to take us to unholy things. For example, we are with a set of friends who are not in the world. Maybe they are not believers and they want to go for parties. So we may want to spend that time with Jesus. Our spirit is saying, spend that time with Jesus. But our friends, because we want to be in the world, we want to be acknowledged by our friends. We want to be in that circle. We said, okay, we are coming for that party. We go with, the, with our friends and we get drawn into these things. So this is where the spirit and the, the flesh are in continuous conflict with each other so that you do if they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want but if he says he says but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law so the acts of the flesh are obvious so what are the acts of the flesh sexual immorality immorality impurity excessive indulgence sex extreme indulgence in bodily pleasures alcohol or drugs idolatry witchcraft hatred discord jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, all these things are works of the flesh, dissensions, fractions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. So basically he's warning us as he did before that the, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's basically telling us to be led by the spirit. I know sometimes that we may, we will we'll have to, our friends will just leave us because they'll think we are gone nuts. Like all the time we won't talk about God. And that's something that you've got to accept because I know a lot of people like make fun of you or they laugh at you when you are in the world or when you are, you all the time talk about God because when you're in love with God, that's all you want to talk about. 
So when you're in love with someone, that's the person that you want. Example, when you're in love with your boyfriend, all you want to talk about is him. So now that you have found Jesus and you've felt the love of Jesus and you are in love with Jesus and you have that relationship with Jesus, all you want to talk about is Jesus. So many people think that you're gone crazy. And that's when your friends start leaving you. So that's why Jesus always says that we need to be with like-minded people because we will not be able to fellowship with unbelievers or with people who do not love Jesus. They don't know the love of Jesus. So obviously, they're not going to know how you are feeling, or what, is, uh, what is making you say all these things. So they will just get bored of your talks and they'll leave you. But then that's okay as well because, see, the year, we are here to do God's work. We are not here to be please people. We are supposed to please God. We are only meant to be God pleasers, not people pleasers. So it's okay if people leave us. Maybe they were not meant to be in our circle or not meant to be with us. So what was obvious to St. Paul does not seem obvious to us. So many of us profess to be followers of Christ. So yet we walk, so St. Paul knew all this, but many of us profess to be followers of Christ. Yet we walk with one foot in the world doing the thing St. Paul says which prevent us from entering heaven. So although we are with Christ, so many of us are going to church. We are going, we are doing religion. We are doing rosaries, navinas. We are going daily to church, but we're not understanding the scriptures. So what we are doing is we are doing, we think we are in Christ. We think we love Jesus. We think we have found Jesus, but we don't know his word. We don't know his will. And we are walking in this way. We are continuously going, doing all these things, what religion wants us to do. That is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. It's good. But you also need to know the word. You also need to know what God wants of you. And all that is in his word. If you're not reading the Bible, you're not, you don't know anything about his word. And you don't know what is his will for you. So how are you going to do his will? If you don't know what he, he wills for you. So that's why St. Paul is, uh, is telling us that, you know, although we are followers of Christ and we think like, oh, I'm a, I'm an Eucharist minister. I'm doing this in the church. I'm a lector. I'm this, I'm that. So although we are doing all these things and we say we are followers of Christ, our one foot is in the world doing the things that St. Paul says but would prevent us from entering heaven. And what are those things that would prevent us all what we read in Galatians 5, 16 to 21? So when we do such things, we are not leading godly lives as we are supposed to. We are living like people of the world. So St. Paul warns us about what happens to people who don't live in the spirit. He's warning us. And it's, it's a clear warning in the Bible. So we need to take this and take, take it as an important warning. So Jesus also warns us about the same thing. When he says that branches that aren't on the vine, he's telling us clearly that if you are not on the vine, if you are not rooted in me, uh, he would pick us, they would be picked up and thrown into the fire and be burned. That's what, that's what happens to dead branches. So this is a clear warning and a very strict word that God is giving us. He's warning us. So we need to take all these warnings very seriously. It's not a joke. It's in the Bible and it's, it's a serious. If we say we are followers of Christ and we are going about reading the word, sharing the word, you know, going to church, saying the rosary, saying the Navinath, but if we are not picking up our Bible and not learning the scriptures, we don't know anything what God wants us to do. And it is really that because if without the help of the Holy Spirit, you will never be able to understand the scriptures. So the idea is every day to call on the Holy Spirit. Call on the Holy Spirit in the morning. Holy Spirit, I love you. Be my helper. Take control of my tongue, my day, my lips. And, you know, uh, teach me everything. Take control of my life. And that's when the Holy Spirit will start taking control. Say this simple, small prayer. I know it will be difficult. But for you to understand the scriptures, you need to have the Holy Spirit. It's only with the Holy Spirit that you'll be able to understand. He is your teacher. So he's going to be your helper and he's going to lead us. So if we let God's word remain in, remain in us so and, uh, and we will find ourselves resisting our fleshly urges. Basically, we will start resisting the desires of our flesh. And what is fasting? Like I told you all before, fasting is basically resisting our fleshly urges and desires. So we are we are controlling the desires of our flesh. And when we control the desires of our flesh and let the word of God take full power, that's when the Holy Spirit will start working in us. So for that, we need a lot of practice. We need to start practicing daily, slowly, every day, like making some effort, maybe trying to avoid something. Don't give in to all these desire to eat, be a glutton and just continuously eat. Or don't just give in to the desire of getting angry. Try to control, have that patience, move out from the situation. If you can't control your tongue, see, like with me, I had always had this problem. I always need to tell people what uh, what they're doing is wrong. And I used to say it, but now I make an effort to move away from the problem. I may make an effort to run away into my room and sit quietly. If I feel I'm going to open my mouth and say something that is not going to be godly or not going to like, you know, uh, do something good for somebody. And then I try to run away because I get into situations. So 
kind of like the devil likes to put you into situations where you have to open your mouth and speak some nonsense that's when he, he wants you to open your mouth and do that so the idea is to just zip up your mouth so that's what we read in the proverbs like proverbs 18:21 says the death and life are in the power of your tongue so we need to control our tongue because we can either speak death or we can speak life so the idea is to speak life not death so if you think you're going to speak death then better to move out from the situation the holy spirit will help us realize the difference between living according to the flesh or living by the spirit so if you prefer living by the rules of the world or living according to the ways of heaven and when we live a divine life we will be blessed so the the psalmist in psalm 1 uh, sister can you read psalm number 1 1 to 3 yes sir. happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread are sit in the seat of scoffers but their delight is in the law of the lord and on his law they meditate day and night they are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither in all that they do they prosper amen Amen. So to quote the psalmist, is he saying, "Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night." The person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. So whatever they do prospers. So we will also be able to draw people to Christ. So the great commission to make disciples of all nations was not given to only few people, just to you, me, or anybody. It's given to uh, to it was given two thousand years ago. and uh, this, we are supposed to make disciples of all nations was not given exclusively to a few, few people it was given to all of us who consider ourselves followers of of christ so if you consider today if you are here listening to this and you consider yourself a follower of christ you have to ask yourself are you am, am i uh, doing what i'm commissioned to do am i doing the work that god has commissioned me we are not kept here on this earth just to like while away time to take up space we are here to do god's work to give glory to god that's the primary purpose to give glory to god to testify about what he has done for us to be a witness to him that's what we are here for to all everything has to go to the part of giving glory to god so that's all we need to do because god is our creator everything we have is from him everything that we get in our lives is from him it's not that i am going to work and i'm earning my money it's my money it's my work and you know it's all come from god if you remember that simple thing that everything you have right from the slippers on your feet to the hair on your head is all from god and all we if we know it is from god then all we need to do is get up in the morning and thank him for everything so that's what we need to have gratitude so co- consequently uh, here's a question to ask ourselves what would uh, would a person want to follow christ when they see us so if we say we are following christ if we say we are bearing the fruits then we need to ask ourselves uh, would a person want to follow christ when they see us so are they seeing christ in us so if they see that we are worried or we are anxious or we are fearful if they see we get angry all the time if they see we are harsh or rude why, uh, why would they want to follow christ because if if we are saying we are like christ and we are all these things i'm sure people will not want to follow see like with me also the thing is i still have to calm myself down where i need to uh, about opening my mouth so this is all the holy spirit is teaching us he's he's teaching us slowly he's putting all these these virtues in us patience self control gentleness faithfulness so uh, if uh, if we find that you know if they find us full of like if people see us and if if they find all these things that like we are getting angry all the time then they'll not tell think christ is not in us however if they find us full of love peace patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self control qualities very few people possess so they will gravitate towards us so basically if they if they see all these qualities that they see in jesus uh, they heard about it jesus they will come towards us without us even trying so uh, people will start coming towards us and you know taking our help or you know asking us how we how they can also bear these fruits so we need to bear these fruits so and if we want to bring people to christ so this is a very important part and uh, jesus is going to say this to now we are coming to the passion of christ this is just a few today's left and then now we'll be into the passion so he also tells us then after this he will give us the promised holy spirit so now when you receive that promised holy spirit 
you need to bear these fruits so it is the easiest way is to evangelize so when we are bearing fruits we need to bring people to christ and what are we doing we are st- we start evangelizing so there is a saying uh, say there is a saying preach at all times if necessary use words we definitely need to use words to let people know about jesus but our lives most importantly our life should reflect our faith and this is by the fruit that we bear how will our lives reflect the faith is by the fruit that we bear now i told you all about all these fruit there are so many different types of fruit that we need to bear so we need to think and ask ourselves what fruit we are having and how we can get the alpha because it's promised to everybody but the holy spirit will give at his discretion he will see how you are functioning he will test you and he will teach you and while he's teaching you he will see how much you're learning how much you're going out and sharing it's not only to learn for ourselves we don't need to keep all this to ourselves we need to teach everybody everybody needs to know how to bear fruit and that's how if we have today i am going out and sharing the word tomorrow you will go out and share share the word tomorrow somebody else will go out and share the word and slowly it'll be like a chain and everybody will be sharing the word so that everybody will be knowing about jesus everybody will be bearing fruit it's not a selfish thing that only one person has to bear fruit everybody needs to bear fruit so now uh, the next point i'm going to tell you all is uh, is uh, pruning and it's the last point so i cannot end this without speaking about pruning and this is essential in the process of bearing fruit so as we grow we will need to have regular pruning so what is pruning pruning is like breaking off the dead branches and taking away all the things that stop us from bearing the fruit so as we grow we will need to have regular pruning so jesus is metaphor for vine and branches makes this easier to understand as well so when he says in john 15:1 to 2 i am the true vine and my so can you read john 15:1 to 2 yes sister i am the true vine and my father is the vine grower he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit amen amen so you jesus is clearly telling you how like we can do this pruning so he is saying i am the true vine and my father is the gardener he cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful so when we do this when he when he's doing this pruning and he's cutting off the things that are not fruitful like the things of the world the fleshly desires the desires of the flesh like when you have excesses uh, eating you want to eat excessive food or you're doing all these worldly things sexual desires all this is slowly cutting off as you see him cutting off he's pruning you so like in my life also like i saw that these things were getting cut off like uh, slowly slowly i have no desire for them they just being cut off and that's the work of the holy spirit he's cutting them off slowly you don't know it he's doing it slowly slowly all these things are getting you just need to have patience and you need to be rooted in his word remain in jesus and that's when he'll help you to bear the fruit so he will slowly prune you and uh, a grape is a fruit of uh, like the woody vine so woody vines like uh, uh, without human in- intervention vines grow into a bushy mess so normally when if we if we don't if uh, if a, a, a grape vine is growing it if we are not going and pruning it regularly if it doesn't have a human touch to it it will just grow into a very bushy mess of leaves and branches so this doesn't result in good grapes so basically when grapes are growing they just grow wild but there are always gardeners or farmers who are doing the pruning so this uh, they go they therefore pruning is required so the cutting off of excess leaves and branches is required for the the tree to to produce fruit so that's how you get more fruit so this helps the vines to stay nice and organized and focus their energy on growing juicy and tasty grapes so that is what pruning is important so if the vine could talk it would tell us that pruning is painful basically if the if the grape tree could talk it would say that pruning is painful and the same with us when we are like getting cut off from all these worldly things so we are so much in the world we want all these things of the world so now god is cutting off these things slowly so like it's saying it like if the vine could talk it would tell us how painful prone pruning is so in the context of human beings this pruning is basically what is pruning it is called disciplining so and it's equally painful so what is the holy spirit doing to you he's disciplining you and it's a painful process because you you are in the world of course we are living in the world we want to be amongst our friends we want to do so he's not telling you not to have fun or not to it's just he's just put taking off things that don't uh, are stopping you from producing those fruit so basically he's pruning you 
which is equally pain painful. However, it is necessary, like a father would discipline his children to ensure that they don't go in stress. It's an example of a father and a child. And when we are small, our parents discipline us. Maybe they whack us with a cane or they do something, but they are basically disciplining us so that we don't go wrong. So same way, like when Jesus does the pruning, it's like the father does the pruning. He's, because we are not attached to Jesus, he's taking off all the things that are stopping us from being attached to Jesus. So like a father would discipline his children to ensure that they don't go astray, our father in heaven will accordingly discipline us to ensure that we don't go astray, which led the author of the letter of the Hebrews to say in Hebrews 12, 11. Sister, can you read Hebrews 12, 11? Yes. Twelve, eleven. Now, yes. Now discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Amen. So here the letter of the Hebrews, uh, the author of the letter of the Hebrews is saying, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. It is always painful when we are being disciplined. Later on, however. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, and also saying James says in uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Sister, can you read James chapter 1, verses yes. 2 to 4? Yes. James 1, 2 to 4, sister. That's right. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind consider it nothing but joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing amen amen so here saint james is saying consider pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds. So many of us are facing trials today. Many of us are going to the after effects of the pandemic or are continuously having a cough or a cold or anything. They have so many problems like with the earthquakes, the floods. So we are all facing trials. But here he's reassuring us that when we face these trials, it's the testing of your fate and it produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be more mature and complete not lacking anything. So when we go through this pruning, pruning, all of us will go through it if we aren't already. Some of us are already going through Like I'm already going through this pruning. We're all going through it. So let us bear it like we need, we need to know that God will make good fruit come out of it. So so most, uh, so what, what uh, the scriptures are saying here is that we all need to bear fruit. And we are coming to that time when Jesus is also telling us that, you know, he must go and so the work of the Holy Spirit is very important. So that's why again and again, I'm stressing on reading your Bibles, taking out your Bibles and reading the scriptures, getting to understand the word, because the word is so important. Without the word, we'll not be able to walk this, this journey of faith. We need to know the scriptures. So, and we need to know the scriptures to bear fruit. So God is going to do all this to us. So uh, today I will end this topic about bearing fruit. So may you, all of you bear fruit in abundance and May God's Spirit always be with you. The Holy Spirit always be with you. So I'll make a short closing prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that you have given us. You're sharing your word and listening to your word, Lord. Let us all place this word in our hearts, Lord. And let all of us go out and bear those fruits that you so want us to bear of love, peace, joy, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness. Let us all go out and bear those fruits. Holy Spirit, take control of everyone present here, Lord. Take control of their hearts. Take control of their lives. Be the helper, Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter. Be everything to them, Lord. Even if they have nobody, Lord, if many people are alone at their houses, they have nobody to turn to when they're sorrowful, when they're sad, Lord. Help them in their times of sorrow, That knowing that you are there within them. You, the Holy Spirit, are present. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are present within us. And we don't need to be worried. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be scared. We just need to go out and bear those fruits. We need to be rooted and cling to that vine. As Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. So let us be those branches <clears throat> clinging to Jesus all the time. And let us get our nourishment out of Jesus. 
So when we get that nourishment out of Jesus, we bear those fruit that Jesus wants us to bear. And then we can go out and share Jesus to everybody. Let us find, feel the love that Jesus gives us, Lord. Let us, let all of us present here feel that love. Bless everyone present here, Lord. Bless their family, Sister Jessica, Brother Andre, all those present on this platform, each and every one of them and their families. Bless them, Lord. Bless them to go out and share your word and be your disciples. Let us take that commission that you have given seriously. Let all of us take that commission, not one or two of us. All of us need to take our commission seriously and go out and do works. It may be small works or maybe big works, whatever we can do in the day. Let us try and get at least one soul per day, Lord. Help us all, teach us. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your word and thank you for placing it in our hearts. We make this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, sister.